Um, a few months ago, uh, actually shortly after he'd arrived, I asked our vicar, Steve, who in a real sense is our ordinary, that is the one who is in charge and keeps us on the straight path, but actually he gives us the freedom to do everything, doesn't he, David? He's really wonderful in that way. Uh, but he said, yes, it was fine for me to remember my ordination today, although I do it most days. Um, he said the only thing that he hesitated about was the fact that he couldn't be here. He would have liked to have been with us this morning. So where do you start after all these years? Well, um, it's where our faith started, really. Or at least, it's where our faith began to focus on uh, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. And so I want to start in the same place. I want to start in the cradle. I was born in um, 1956 on the 28th day of August. Remember that? It isn't far away. Um, <laughs> and I, I was baptized on the 11th day of the 11th month at 1 o'clock. I was there, and yet I can't remember it. But I do remember when I found my baptism certificate in a drawer, um, how thrilled I was that my parents had decided that this was completely appropriate. I went on to be confirmed by Bishop Geoffrey Allen at the age of nine and a half. I should have been confirmed in Bolsover, but the church in Bolsover was on fire, so they shipped everybody across to Matlock Bath, to All Saints Matlock Bath, where the Bishop of Repton was also conducting a confirmation. And so the numbers shot up, and there were, it doesn't happen these days, but there were 78 people confirmed that night by the two bishops. And it was um, a wonderful celebration. I got to 14, and I asked the vicar if I could uh, do the training to be a reader. And he said, well, I think you should speak to the bishop direct, because he'll just say no to me. I spoke to the bishop, and he said, you're going to wait a few years, are you? I said, no, I want to start now. He said, well, if your vicar will tutor you, you can begin the course. I did the course and completed it in just under three years. And on All Saints Day, um, in that third year, I was admitted as a reader in the Diocese of Derby. Uh, the bishop told everyone I was the youngest reader in the Church of England. And in actual fact, when I looked around that day at the others being admitted, I think he was probably right, because most of them looked like dinosaurs. Um, but I'm the dinosaur now. It wasn't long after that that for, I think, very good reasons, I left the Church of England, and one of those reasons was that they wouldn't accept me for ordination training. Um, they said um, that I wasn't an appropriate person uh, to be trained for ordination. And for weeks and weeks, I wandered the highways and byways, wondering where I would fit. And some of my friends from school said, well, we go to the United Reformed Church, why don't you come with us? And I started going to church with them. And 
uh, entered into membership of that church, and after a reasonable period, I candidated for the ministry of the United Reformed Church. I was um, ordained as a minister in the Church of God uh, in Derby Cathedral on the 14th of July, 1990. I'd been ordained a deacon six years before that because we had this strange practice at the time that we ordained people as deacons before they actually went to theological college. I think it was part of the church saying, we believe in you, and we're going to tie you down. We're going to implant the Holy Spirit upon you, so it's more difficult for you to change your mind. Um, I struggled every day through theological training. Uh, some of you may know, others won't, but I'm dyslexic. Um, I find it hard to read. I find it even harder to write. Uh, but I do it and I manage. Um, and I regularly write articles for journals, for Christian journals. Um, and I completed my ordination training, as I say, to be ordained on July the 14th. 1990. And it's been a tremendous um, journey of faith. I'd heard the call of God when I was very young. I tested the call of God in the church when I was in my late teens. And the church said that it acknowledged that call. And at my ordination, um, two bishops of the Church of South India uh, took part in the laying on of hands and created an ecumenical mess that the church didn't know what to do with. Am I a minister of the United Reformed Church? Am I a minister of the Church of South India? Am I an Anglican? I don't know. Does it matter? It really, in active ministry, I'm not active anymore. The church says I'm inactive in retirement. But when I was active, the only thing that... Um, encouraged me to be a minister of the United Reformed Church was on the 28th day of every month when I got my paycheck. But rest of the month, I paid very little notice of that fact. That's enough about me. Um, I'm not the reason you're here this morning. The reason you're here this morning is to give glory to God to him and none other. That glory being discharged to Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so, just as I considered for a long time the call to ministry, I want to encourage every one of you this morning to consider what God might be calling you to in the future. And there is no man or woman or young person that is too young or too old to respond to the call of God. I hope you have sleepless nights when God is nagging you forward. I really do. And it might be something really simple that God calls you to, but that can be very important in his plan and purpose. And when you feel like that, the, 
right and proper thing to do is to test it out in the church. To take the risk of telling other people how you feel and that God has been talking to you and encouraging you forward in ministry. And I use that term ministry because so often, often, we become bogged down and just think about ministers and priests. Yeah, I believe we're important to the life of the church, but you are of greater importance. Because what one pair of hands can do, what one mind can do in the service of God, is fairly limited. But what we can do together is unbelievable. And in the gospel, Jesus said, you know, I'm going to the Father and I will send the Holy Spirit to be with you. And when I send that Spirit, he will enable you to do things that I've never even been able to do. I've been restricted, Jesus said, to a particular time and place. But you can go out into the whole world and proclaim the gospel afresh to all people. When Vera and I came for the first time to live in Derby and uh, in Alveston, um, I used to go to the rugby club. Um, I didn't play in the league matches very often because they conflicted with weddings. And usually there were better scrums at the weddings than there were at the rugby. Um, but after we'd done training, or on the odd few occasions um, when I played in the league games, I used to go and shower with everybody else, this wonderful bath that was about five foot deep in hot water, and showers as well. And we couldn't afford showers. We hadn't got enough shillings to put in the gas meter. I was only a poor parson after all. And um, the men used to treat me quite normally. And then the undertaker came to see me one night and he said to me, could you take this funeral? And I said, yeah, I'll take this funeral. I said, but I've no recollection of knowing that family. Well, no, they've not actually asked for you, but I'm, I think you can do a good job. So I went to see the family. And when I went to see the family about the um, funeral, two of the sons of the man who died were actually members of the rugby club. And that was the first time they found out that I was a minister. And when they found out that I was a minister, it spoilt it. Because way before, we used to strip off into that beautiful suit that we were born in and plunge into the bath together and have all sorts of conversations. That was the last time it happened. Because after, I, after that, when I went in, they all went quiet, they all got out of the bath, and they left me on my own. Because they thought that I was some weird creation. And of course, they were right. But they were weird as well. What we need to do is open doors to people. We need to be missionaries, not just in the benefits but wherever we go. We've been at the Great Yorkshire Show this week, and I've had some tremendous conversations uh, about faith. We went to a birthday party in Burton on Trent yesterday, and um, when we weren't talking about David Fergus, we were talking about God. It was a good place to be. And Vera says, I embarrass her sometimes because I talked to complete strangers. And there was a woman on Thursday that I talked to at the 
great Yorkshire show, and I could tell she was a Jewess. And I still talked to her about Jesus. And she said to me, you love Jesus. You love Jesus, don't you? I said, yes. I said, I can't help it. I can't help loving him. And she said, I've been inquiring and questioning about Jesus for the last 40 years. I just wish I could love him like you do. And she said, then I could leave the routine and monotony of Jewish worship and come to the joy and purpose of Christian faith. Not my words, but his. I was but the gateway to the kingdom of heaven. Faithfulness. I think I was taught faithfulness, first of all by a nun, who sadly uh, left the consecrated life after about 15 years, when one of the bishops of this diocese handled the closing of the convent of St. Lawrence at Belper in a very messy way. He thought it was just a case of moving six people somewhere else. When I knew the convent, it had got 50 nuns. It got down to six and he sent them here, there, and everywhere. And they were just heartbroken. And of the six, four left the consecrated life. And that will not do. We need to support all people at all times in their Christian life and ministry. And we do that so often by being faithful. And Sister Helen taught me what faithfulness was about. And then on Thursday, I think it was, it might even have been Friday, we sat watching a sheepdog trial. Friday? And... Um, it reminded me of the sheepdogs I had at home and uh, some of the relationships that I built, built with them. I didn't have to speak to them. They knew what I wanted them to do and they did it. And again, they taught, taught me faithfulness. And I saw that at the sheepdog trial again on, on, on Friday. I got one sheepdog when I was in my middle twenties, that was absolutely useless. It would do somersaults, it would stand on its head, you name it, it would do it. But it, if it went into a field of sheep, it ran away because it was frightened. And somebody said to me one Monday morning at Bakewell Cattle Market, you haven't got any spare dogs out of you at present. I said, I've got one. I said, you can have him. He's a really good dog, as long as you keep him in the farmyard. So if you want to load lorries, he'll put cattle on the lorry, he'll put sheep on the lorry, he'll put ducks on the lorry. But take him out in the field and he runs straight back to the farmyard because he's frightened. Well, this uh, fella lived up at Fulo in the north of the county. And he left our place at about two o'clock in the afternoon, having seen me wake the dog and decided that he'd have a go with him. Two o'clock in the afternoon. He drove back to Fulo with this dog and he took the dog down the field to bring some sheep up that he was going to sell the next day. And the dog ran off and he was back at our farm in 
uh, Riddings near Alfreton uh, by about half past eight. He'd come for his supper. He didn't like what they were offering him. But he'd come all that way back. I sold him again to a man at Melton Mowbray and he did just the same again. He was so faithful and yet so useless. And I think sometimes that's how God looks at us. He sees that we don't always achieve what we want, he wants us to achieve. But what he really values is our faithfulness. God doesn't judge us by the degrees we've got. In fact, one of my tutors used to say, the more degrees a priest's got is a sign of how long it will take him to close a church by degrees. I remember taking some members of our congregation to Sheffield Cathedral and I was absolutely bored out of my mind listening to this sermon. And I said to the ladies I'd taken to Sheffield that night, I said, what do you think to that tonight then? Well, the sermon must have been good because we couldn't understand it. That will not do. We want face workers like David and Stephen and Steve and me and Stanley. People who've worked at the face for Jesus and don't try to wrap it up in technical language, but to offer to God the everyday language that enables people to come closer to the throne of grace. And I want to say to you finally, is there any of you who feel that God is having a niggle, that he might have some fresh purpose for you, then talk to one of us. Talk to a, a, a member of the ministry team and let us have the privilege of walking with you and taking you closer to God. It may be that you just need to declare your faith again. You know, there's people who've been sitting in these pews for 70 and 80 years. But that will never make them a Christian. Jesus was born in a stable, but it didn't make him a horse. It's only close encounter with God and his son through the power of the Holy Spirit that will bring us nearer and closer to the throne of grace. So come and walk with me and with all my colleagues in ministry and let's sing countless alleluias to the one who is Lord to the one who is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, this day and every day. Hallelujah.